In early 2001, Bethany McLean, at the time a writer for Fortune magazine, asked the question in an article, how does Enron make its money? McLean's reporting, along with others who wrote articles, led to a lot of inquiries that were put to the Enron management. Within a few months, the company was bankrupt. Bethany McLean's subsequent 2003 book titled Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room, became a bestseller. Next, a successful documentary. Since 2008, McLean has made a career of writing about American financial crises. In January, she discussed her reaction to the Theranos saga. In an essay about convicted felon Elizabeth Holmes, she wrote, quote, For those who believe she was guilty of a great crime, it's a disappointing verdict, end quote. Bethany McLean, you recently wrote an essay about the Elizabeth Holmes verdict. Why? Well, the New York Times came to me and asked if I'd be willing to write an essay when, when the verdict came out. And I thought, yes, because it tapped into a bunch of things that I had been mulling over in the back of my mind. And there are two thoughts that don't necessarily relate, although I tried successfully or not to pull them together in, in, in the piece. But one is whether penalties against white collar criminals, um, penalties against cases of business gone wrong, whether they really serve as a deterrent um, or not. And I've thought about that since uh, a piece I did in the wake of the Enron verdicts back in 2006 when Jeff Skilling and Ken Lay were found guilty. And my co-author on the book I did about Enron uh, wrote a piece for Fortune. And the gist of the piece was everything's different now. The world is going to be different. Executives are on notice that they can't engage in the kind of behavior that's right, that's manipulating the rules, that's right up against the line, that's deceptive, even if the law sort of permits it. And everything's going to be different going forward. And of course, this was summer 2006 where the events that caused the financial crisis were already <laughs> were already underway. And uh, it, it did nothing to change that. Um, the financial crisis hit really in, in, in the fall of 2007, a year later. So I started to think, huh, if everything was supposed to be different, why wasn't, wasn't it different? And then the other thought that I have started to mull over is this connection between visionaries and fraudsters. What's really the difference between the two? And I, you, would, you would think that they exist on opposite ends of the spectrum, as far away from each other as, as they could be. But I started to decide they are actually where the ends of a circle meet and that one could become the other pretty, pretty easily because some of the characteristics of each, at least when it comes to stories of business gone wrong to white collar fraud, are actually are quite similar. There, there's very rarely the case of a story of business gone wrong where the executive actually set out to rip people off. What did you think of the verdict? So I was surprised by it, even though the gist of my piece was that these verdicts don't necessarily have larger meanings because of because of some of the factors I just I just talked about. I had actually thought that she would be found guilty of defrauding patients and not guilty of defrauding investors. And I suppose, like a lot of us, my thoughts and hopes about the verdict hinged on reflect my own bias. I believe that any investor who put money into Theranos without getting audited financial statements, and she, she and Theranos would never provide audited financial statements, d deserves to be ripped off. That's just a ridiculous thing to do. On the other hand, patients are not supposed to have to investigate the validity and viability of their blood test provider. You're not supposed to have to go to Walgreens and find out who's providing your blood test and make sure that they're reputable and that they're that are actually doing what they said what they said they were. So the, the standard is different for, for, for both. And the jury the jury found the opposite. They found her guilty of defrauding investors, but but not guilty of defrauding patients. So break break it down for those who haven't paid attention to the details. Uh, Theranos is what kind of a company does it still exist? What did it do? So Theranos uh, was founded by a woman named Elizabeth Holmes. And the whole idea of the company was that you could revolutionize blood testing. Instead of 
having to do this big draw from your vein, you know, when you go into your doctor's office and you have the, the syringe or needle put into your vein and you watch the vials of blood filling up and you think, ah, <laughs> um, the idea was that instead you could just do a single finger prick and off that little tiny bit of blood, you could run every test that a patient needed. And so the idea was this would be less of a hassle for patients who are afraid of needles, but also that it would make the whole process so much easier because you could do this at, say, a Walgreens or a grocery store, and therefore it would be really good for people's health because they would you would you would make something easy and instantaneous that had been difficult and, and expensive and you know, required a trip to the doctor's office. Uh, um, and so she, this idea that she could revolutionize this important area of, of medicine that, that's used in all sorts of diagnostics from, you know, thyroid issues to HIV to anything, you, you, you name it, blood, blood draws are incredible, an incredibly important diagnostic tool, uh, that she could revolutionize this and in the process make, make, make a ton of money. And it turned out, um, and it started to unravel when the Wall Street Journal ran um, some detailed investigative stories basically saying, the technology didn't work. And she was, instead of running all the tests on this machine she'd invented called the Edison that, that, that supposedly that that could that could analyze this tiny drop of blood. They had actually Theranos had actually jerry rigged um, testing equipment from other established companies uh, in order to basically pretend that they that 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 they could do it. And so she was eventually charged with fraud, both for lying to patients about her technology, and um, with she raised I think nine hundred million dollars from investors, and for raising lying to investors about the money that Theranos was making and the promise of its technology she's going to be 38 in february how old was she when she started with all this i think she was 20 when she started the company she was quite young and that really fit in i mean 10 years ago maybe even maybe not 10 years ago 20 years ago if you had said that a 20 year old who didn't graduate from college and had no experience in medicine no experience building technological equipment of any kind was going to revolutionize something as complicated as blood blood testing and and it is very complicated a lot of people have tried to do this in, in, in the past. People would have been like, oh, my God, that's ridiculous. But, you know, in the frenzied environment that we were in in the, it, it, in the past decade, it seemed obvious. Of course, young people are smarter than old people. Of course, young people without any experience and any um, any bona fides about about what they can do. Of course, they're better than an old person with experience who may know what they're talking about. And so, people just lined up to 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 get to give her money. And I think some of it was also it was a reflection of just how much money there there was. And I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, but the amount of money to fund startup companies has just exploded um, over the last 15 or 20 years. And then part of it was that she tapped into this moment when Silicon Valley was starting to ask questions or said more accurately, a lot of people were starting to ask questions of Silicon Valley about the total lack of diversity that most people who get funded are, are, are white men. And Elizabeth tapped into this desire to see uh, a, a woman do well in the world. And I think that helped her raise just an extraordinary sum of money. Back in 2003, you wrote a book called The Smartest Guys in the Room that became a successful documentary. <clears throat> you originally wrote a article for Fortune magazine. Uh, did that article trip everybody's switch that led to the bankruptcy? No, I really don't think it did. Um, and I think there are two reasons for that. The article actually didn't get a ton of attention when it when it came out. It was only after Enron's bankruptcy that people looked back and said, why didn't anybody ask questions? And then people said, oh, look, some, somebody did. And so I think it's one of those rare times in life where you get too much credit for something because in the end, and this is part of the reason that I don't think the article caused or precipitated Enron's bankruptcy, in the end, while I asked a lot of questions about how Enron made its money, I didn't actually expose what was really going on under, under the surface there. Um, and so so I think of the story as more of a red flag rather than uh, she broke the story. And, and some, I think it takes more than what I did to get people to say, especially about a really, really 
well-loved and admired company. It, it takes more than what I did to get people to start to start second guessing. But the other reason I think that the article didn't cause Enron's bankruptcy is that I really picked up on a lot of skepticism that was brewing about Enron. I didn't cause it. I had sources who were saying, even though they weren't on the record, who were saying there, there are a lot of problems here. And after the fact, I, after Enron's bankruptcy, when I did the reporting for my book, I found out there were a lot of people raising questions and a lot of people who were skeptical of Enron. And so I think I picked up on that under, I think I picked up on that underlying skepticism. And it's, it's an interesting point worth highlighting about the difference between the world then and the world now, because in in the world then, people who were skeptical, namely short sellers, people who bet that a stock is going to decline, weren't public. They didn't, they didn't have a forum in which to express themselves publicly, and many didn't. So it was as if, even in a world that was supposedly awash in information, it's as if there were these two separate spheres that didn't touch each other, and one was the sphere of publicly available information, which was all, Enron is fantastic, the stock is going to double, these guys are petropreneurs, they're the, most, they're the smartest guys in the room. And then the other circle was a circle of very quiet pe people saying amongst themselves, this, this company is a fraud, there's something, there's something really, really wrong here. And that's very different today, mainly due to the advent of, of, of Twitter. Um, if you want to find out what skeptics think about a company, all you have to do is look. It's right there. Um, the interesting thing is that doesn't really change anything in, in, in some ways, but um, but I, I, that is one good way in which social media has, has changed the world, um, I think. Well, the reason I ask you this um, is because I wanted you to talk about the role of the journalist back when you did the article on Enron, and then was it a journalist that tripped again the, the switch on the whole story around Elizabeth Holmes? Yes. So I think the role of a journalist is what it's always been, which is to look at things with a skeptical eye, to listen to all sides of, of, of a story, and to try to expose things that 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 are in the public's interest to 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 be exposed. So I don't think the role of a journalist has 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 changed at all. I think that um, the guy who wrote the pieces at the Wall Street Journal, John Kerry Rue, I think he, I think his his pieces were more of the classic breaking of the story than my pieces about en Enron were. You know, he he really got inside the company. He had whistleblowers inside the company who said this this technology doesn't doesn't work. Um, so I think it, in the end, his work was deeper than mine was. I didn't have whistleblowers inside Enron who were saying this, this, this is a problem. This thing is about to explode. Um, so I, I don't think the role has changed. I think the execution, I'd give him more credit than I'd give myself for, for, for breaking, for breaking the story. I think, I think that's different. Um, I think the ability to do that kind of work has, has, has changed, although not, not necessarily for, for, for someone in John Kerry's position, he was at the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal, like the New York Times, still offers a lot of support to big investigative projects. Uh, that's much harder to do today than it than it used to be. When I wrote about Enron, I was at Fortune magazine, and you know, it was still the golden age of magazine journalism. And Fortune was still part of Time Inc., which still existed, which was still one of the world's most powerful magazine companies. And I could have taken the month or two that I spent on the Enron story, and if it had hadn't panned out, if we had decided that I'd gone down a rabbit hole and it didn't work, it wouldn't have been a problem. I mean, if I had done 10 of those in a row, it would have been a problem. But if you if, if you if you tried to investigate something and it didn't work out, you were a staff writer, you still got paid, you still had a career. It wasn't, and I think the pressure on journalists to execute in the short term is much higher now than it, than it used to be at most places. First time I interviewed you was 2005. And I bring that up because your life has changed somewhat since then. You were married, divorced, and remarried, and you have a couple of kids now, and how old are they? I do. I have a 10 and a 12-year-old. And where do you live? I live mostly in Chicago, although I have an apartment in New York as well and spend some time there. And what does your husband do? Uh, well... Huh. Maybe if this isn't live, maybe we can cut it so I am divorced again. <laughs> um, um, but my husband was a, was a prosecutor and is now a defense lawyer. My so, ex-husband was a prosecutor and is now a defense lawyer there. How's that? <laughs> so, uh, but the reason I ask you this question is how has your view, I mean, I was gonna, I'm going to quote to you what you told me in 2005. 
yeah. and, and I wanted you to just tell me, has your life changed and how do you think about this stuff? You said in 2005, I've become more cynical about corporate America. And then later on, you say to me, I wasn't cynical enough. So where is the cynicism and how is your view of life and corporations and whether or not we're getting a fair shake on this change over the last uh, 15 years? You know, I think I think unfortunately I've become more cynical still and I would like to give you a different answer than that, but I will offer a little bit of a caveat and maybe a ray of hope at the, at the end of what I'm what I'm about to say. But I think even when we spoke, although I was a little I was more cynical, I still did and fundamentally question whether capitalism itself in this country had gone off the rails. I think I still saw Enron as uh, um, as an example of what can go wrong, but as an outlier. I didn't see it as fundamentally indicative of, of a flawed system. And I've, over the last 15 plus years, I've spent a lot of time covering additional stories of business gone wrong, and I've really begun to question some of the fundamental tenets of of our system. I think the financial crisis for me was 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 a really big wake up call, um, um, because it people think of Enron and the financial crisis is, is very different. Enron was a fraud. The financial crisis was you know a bunch of companies who got a little crazy about subprime mortgages. But they're really not that. They're really not that different, and we we obviously bailed out the system in, 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 in the wake of the financial crisis. And there are a lot of other examples we could go into over, over the last decade. And I, I've started to think that these issues we have, of particularly of, of crony capitalism, um, of rules that enable the rich to continue to get richer, are, are, are really problematic. And let me be clear, I have nothing against somebody who invents a business and provides jobs to lots of people making a fortune. That's the, I, I, I'm a believer in that type of, of, of capitalism. So I think I've become I've, I've become a little more cynical because I've started to fundamentally question things, not just say, oh, here's an isolated example of, of how things went wrong. On the flip side, and a little bit of, I guess, the, the ray of hope I, I mentioned, I've also met a, really, a lot of really good people and a lot of businesses that are run well and run run, run right, and a lot of people who are thinking deeply about, about these issues. So, so I don't think it's all darkness. I, I want to. I, I wrote down a as I was thinking through the Theranos situation. I wrote down a bunch of different people uh, that were around this story and wanted to get your take on what role they played. And we'll, let's start with the fact that some very big names: Betsy DeVos, Rupert Murdoch, the Walton family, the Cox family invested in Theranos, and at the same time well-known people became on, on their board. I mean, the list is really, as you know, quite interesting. George Schultz, who died last year at age 100. Gary Ruffhead, the former chief of naval operations, on the board of Theranos. William Perry, former secretary of defense in the Clinton years. Sam Nunn, United States senator from Georgia. Jim Mattis, who was uh, secretary of defense during uh, the Trump administration. Henry Kissinger, Dr. William Frist, who was the former majority leader, Republican in the United States Senate from Tennessee, heart surgeon, lung surgeon. We, I'm not sure I pronounce this right. William Fogey, or Fo, you can tell me how it is, a former director of the uh, CDC. And Riley Bechtel, <clears throat> big name chairman of the board of the Bechtel Group, where George Schultz was for a while. They were all on the board. Right. They got one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, which, as you know, today is not very much money on some of these boards where they get paid four and five hundred thousand. So what were they what good is a board if they missed all this? So let's start with the investors, because I think I have a shorter answer for the investors and my answer about the board would be a bit will be a bit longer. But so with the investors, as I said it the start of this, I have very little sympathy for them. If you are a big wealthy investor, you're supposed to be able to do the kind of due diligence. You're supposed to ask the sort of questions that would have led you not to put any money in, into Theranos. Uh, a really basic fact, Theranos wouldn't provide audited financial statements. So every financial 
projection they provided investors was just woo woo. <laughs> and there were, um, for lack of a better description, and there were other people. Sometimes I wonder if having kids has permanently diminished my vocabulary such that I use words like woo woo, but that's that's an aside anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, um, but, but there were people who didn't put money into Theranos precisely because she wouldn't provide audited financial statements. And that was just that that was that was that was um, definitive for them. They just said, no, we're not we're not doing it. Um, one of the documents that Theranos provided to investors was a document that made it look like Pfizer, among other companies, had endorsed its technology. So if you're a big investor doing due diligence on Theranos, one of the first things you should do is pick up the phone and call Pfizer. As it turned out at the trial, Pfizer's, Pfizer decided the technology was being Yes, and they weren't going to do any work with 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 Theranos. It would have taken a phone call, not not much more. And so I don't have a lot of sympathy for these big investors who lost money. They were victims of their own desire to get rich, their own greed, their own willingness to believe. And there's a great line from this book about a con man in the 1920s who is known as the Jackal of Wall Street. And it says about people who fall for scams, their own willingness to fall for it is to fall for this to fall for it. Is basically what sends some smack into the into the setup, and it's and and that's true. Without people's willingness to be deluded um, because of greed, because of the fear of missing out, uh, a lot of these financial scams simply simply wouldn't happen. So that's the investors. The board, there's there's some of that. I have a little more. It's funny, when I wrote my book, Smartest Guys in the Room, I had, I was very hard on Enron's board. And I've come to have, um, and partly through a friendship with one of the former board members, I've come to have a more nuanced view of, of, of boards because I think they're in a very difficult situation. And one of my favorite quotes is an F. Scott Fitzgerald quote, and I use it often, but it it, it basically is that the, the true mark of genius is being able to hold two competing notions in your mind at the same time and, and not go crazy. And if you're going to join a company's board, then it's not because you think the company's a fraud and the, and the executives are, are idiots. You're joining the because you believe in this thing, right? And so you have to be able to hold your belief in in, in the company with your willingness to be skeptical and ask hard questions at, at the same time. And that's even more complicated if you don't have the background that would enable you to ask hard questions as many of the people, most of the people on Theranos' board did. And in the end, the fact that people didn't have the right background, there, there was and uh, somebody from a technology background who had worked on blood draws before. There, there wasn't a doctor who had, who had studied this for decades. And in the end, the fact that her board consisted of these big names with political power um, perhaps should have been a warning sign to investors because why didn't she have a board of people who were equipped to understand what her technology could do and what the limitations and what the right, what, what the right questions were to ask. So it is somewhat on her board members and on any board members, um, you know, if you're going to join a board, you should have some understanding or there should you should make sure there are other people on the board who have an understanding of what uh, of what limitations the company is up against. And if there aren't any um, and you don't yourself understand it, then perhaps that should be a big a, a, a big red flag. Um, so. That's so. I, I'm a little bit more nuanced on 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 on, on the board, but they, they 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 were suckered too because they were willing to be suckered. But if I'm an investor, I'm talking about a stock investor in that company. I look at that board and say they're they have a fiduciary responsibility to keep watch on what's going on. How, these are big names. You can't get any bigger than George Schultz or Gary Ruffhead or Bill Perry or Sam Nunn, Jim Mattis, Henry Kissinger, William Frist. And it, how did she how did she buffalo them? Were they paying any attention at all? And how much of this goes on in other corporations that you've studied? So <laughs> I think I think they in in some ways for a good reason, right? Here's this young, attractive, blonde woman who's promising to revolutionize the world. I think it made them feel good about themselves to be supporters of, of, of her. 
members. And I think that was a, an important element of how they deluded them, themselves into not not asking tough questions. And that that stems from a sort of good impulse, right? Uh, there's there's I, there's nothing more dangerous. Well, there probably are more dangerous things. But one very dangerous thing in the world is when something makes you feel really good about yourself, like you're like you're doing good. And I think that was that was that was part of part of part of the story here. I think it was the I, the attraction of being part of something that was going to change change the world, that was going to make a big difference in people's lives because of the easy availability of of of, of, of blood tests. I don't. I think you would have to, and thus far, nobody on the board, even at the trial, has been willing to be really, really candid about why they, they got it wrong. And I think those would be really interesting interviews if people were willing to say, here's here's why I believed, here's why I didn't ask tough questions. My guess is the answer would be similar but slightly different in, in all cases. But 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 yes, I think to your point, it that that story has played out again again and again. Um, one of the one of the bits that came out in trial testimony in Theranos was where a very sophisticated sophisticated hedge fund said to another hedge fund, look at these board members, wowza, um, speaking of inarticulate language, but whatever. <laughs> um, but because because the board was so impressive and investors do look to that and, and they say, oh, look, look, look at these people who have signed off on this. And it has played out in, in other stories. One of the um, other big corporate calamities of the last decade was a company called Valiant that ended up not going bankrupt, but lost, I think, around $100 billion in market cap. And what it turned out Valiant was doing was taking drugs that were needed to save people's lives and raising the price on them to whatever the market would bear um, and making its profits in, in large part uh, in substantial ways that that way. And a lot of people invested in Valiant because of the other investors who were involved, a guy named Bill Ackman, a really well-regarded hedge fund called Value Act, another really well-regarded investment fund called Sequoia. And so people said, oh, I don't have to do my homework. Look at these people who have done their homework. I'm just going to get a free ride with with them and i think that does speak to the limits of ever outsourcing your due diligence ever thinking that because another smart person says something is right therefore it's it's right because those smart people could have different incentives than you do or they could just be getting it wrong because because they're getting it wrong and and so in the end there is never any substitute for doing your own homework and applying your own skeptical lens to something so we have this powerful board. There, a lot of them were very old, including, uh, as I said, the hundred-year-old George Schultz. Uh, Bill Perry's ninety-four years old, I think. Henry Kissinger's ninety-eight years old. But I'm leading up to this: Tyler Schultz, twenty years old. Tyler Schultz, what role did he play and who was he? And is that an interesting thing to look at, the old guys versus a 20-year-old and what happened to this company? Right. So it's a fascinating story. And if you want to know the inner details of it, you should either watch uh, Alex Gibney's film, The Inventor, or read John Kerry Rue's book, Bad Blood, because that has all the really stunning details of, of, of the story and how Tyler, who was George Schultz's Schultz's grandson ended up working at Theranos because he was such a believer on, uh, in what Elizabeth was trying to do and slowly started to realize that it was all a, a fraud. And I'm saying that in probably more blunt language than, 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 the, than, the, than, the, than the details of the situation actually reflect. But he started to realize there were real problems here. And wow. So when he tried to go to his grandfather and, and when um, the company found out that he he was the one raising questions and had him um, tailed. Um, Theranos' lawyer, a very high-powered lawyer called David Boys, basically went after um, Tyler. And he you know, had there's this moment at, that John Kerry recounts in his book where Tyler is at his uh, has gone to George Schultz to basically say, "Look, I think you're on the board of this company, and you need to get off this board. There are real problems here." And he's ambushed by the company's lawyers when he's when he's there. Uh, uh, and it's just it is such a wonderful saga of 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 whistleblowing and of the dangers that can face a whistleblower and of the bravery of of a lot of whistleblowers. But but since the details of this particular story really belong to other people, not 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 to me. I'm just going to focus on the universal kind of nature of this question, which is that whistleblowers are really interesting figures, right? And I think it takes some element of of being an outsider. And so in Tyler's case, he was really young. And, and 
because he was really young, he was he was able to ask questions that other people who wanted to believe um, weren't weren't willing to ask. Um, um, and and so so it's there's that that is always a really interesting component of these stories of business gone wrong. Who is it that raises questions and what enables them to see things differently than ever? Everybody else sees it because a way of flipping the Theranos story on its on its head is that there were whistleblowers. There was Tyler. There was a woman named Erica Chung. I think there were a couple of others. But in the end, there actually were not that many whistleblowers. There were a lot of people who worked at that company who either kept their mouth shut or simply didn't realize anything was anything was wrong. It, so there's it, it, so there's I, I'm I'm not sure what the exact ratio of whistleblowers to people who kept their mouth shut and their heads down or simply didn't see it. Were, but it's you know it's maybe five percent were whistleblowers and so most people are biased toward belief they just they just are and that's not necessarily a terrible thing about the human species but um, but it but it is striking in instances like this. In, in trying to figure out how Elizabeth Holmes uh, was found, I mean she was originally found guilty for, under four counts in, by the jury. But in order to figure all that out, is it true then? if you just go back and reconstruct it, that Tyler Schultz tipped off Mr. Carreyrou of the Wall Street Journal, among others, that became a story and that started the process? I'm looking, I'm, what I'm looking from you to tell us is how, you know, if you're outside all this, how you can determine whether or not you trust or believe in anything. Yeah, so I can answer the second part better than, than the first because I'm not positive about the exact chain of events. I do not think it was Tyler who originally tipped off John Kerry Roo. I think it was a, a, another healthcare reporter who worked for a blog who, 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 who noticed something in, who had come across some kind of document that cast doubt about Theranos in, in another lawsuit. And I think John might have then stumbled on Tyler by, by himself or perhaps in the course of his investigation, someone, someone who another source told him to call Tyler. But I, I don't think the original um, the original tip off um, um, came from Tyler. Um, but but I think the specifics of of, of this are, are less important than the generality, which is what you're you're getting at and what what what, you, what you're asking about. And I, I think I think it's hard. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of stories that come to light wouldn't happen but for some kind of tip off um so in my case with enron it was a short seller named jim chanos who said who called me and said hey i think something doesn't make sense about this company's numbers why don't you know why don't you, you worked at goldman sachs you understand this stuff why don't you take a closer look at it um and so it, without that would i have ever turned my eye to enron i don't i don't think so um without this call all from this healthcare blog, would John Kerry have dug into Theranos? Maybe eventually it was a big enough deal. Um, maybe maybe he would have, but, but 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 maybe not. And so it it is the, the having a source, having someone who says take a closer look at this is is an, it's it's important. And for people who, I think it's I think it's difficult. I think these these things can take on a life of their own, and and the belief around them can become so cement like that it is. Um, most hard to think. Well, maybe what if all of this isn't true? And I, I, you can see that in so many, so many places. You can see it in the widespread collective belief in Theranos when it seems so obvious that you should step back and say, "Wait, wait, 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 wait. How can a woman in her twenties with no background in technology and no background?" in medicine be able to accomplish something that has eluded um, scientists and inventors for 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 decades does this does it and she won't disclose any information about how her technology works and she doesn't have audited financial statements does this really make sense and so in 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 the end I think a lot of these stories of business gone gone wrong come down to a, a, a our willingness to believe in that thing, which after the fact seems so clearly too good to be true. And there's that great old saying, if it great old cliche, if it seems too good to be true, maybe, maybe it is. <laughs> and and uh, I think that's, I think that's it. That's the basic law through which you should, you should see all kinds of business opportunities. Think back on the financial crisis. The, the whole thing was predicated on a belief that mortgages made to people who clearly couldn't pay them back could somehow through financial alchemy be turned into 
into securities that were as safe as the credit of the United States. And you step back and you say, no, 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 that, that's that, that's not going to work. There's got to be a flaw in that somewhere. Um, but 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 the whole world was deluded by that, including you know back to Theranos's board and whether they could have or should have seen it. You had figures like Hank Paulson and Tim Geithner and Ben Bernanke saying in the run up to the financial crisis, yeah, there's a little bit of a problem here, but it's contained. It's not going to be an issue. Um, <laughs> so so it's astounding the extent to which our willingness to believe can delude not just some of us, but but all of us, even people who really should know better. So um, adding to this uh, discussion and trying to figure it all out is the fact that when she was starting out, the, I, I don't like the term, but the media, the big television companies, the big magazines, all put her on the cover and called her one of the great women of all time. And uh, she was made a member of the Harvard Medical School Board of Fellows in this process. Walgreen bought the whole idea, put it in their stores. The Cleveland Clinic was involved. Again, where is the check and balance in all this? Right. So I think that raises a lot of really good questions. And unfortunately, they are the same really good questions that get raised every time something like this happens with the additional component here that what she was doing directly affected people's health. And that, I think, should be held to a, to a, to a different standard. Although, then again, when you think about what happened in the financial crisis, I mean, losing your house affects your health, too. It affects all sorts of things. So I, 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 I I don't I, I I don't know. But but these are these are these are the these are the same questions that 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 occur time 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 and time again. Um, 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 and and I I I I'd like to believe that a little bit of a skeptical approach would would help. I think when it comes to the media in particular you know, it, it does reflect in some ways <laughs> the risk of being an apolo apolo apologist for the media. It does reflect in some ways the media's desire to find something to celebrate. For all that we are often criticized for looking for things that are wrong and looking for headlines that terrify people and talk about how everything is going wrong in the world, we're actually often looking for good stories of people succeeding against the odds. And in this case, here was this woman in male-dominated Silicon Valley who is achieving these, these awesome things. And I do think there is something good about humanity's willingness to believe and the media's des desire to believe and the media's desire to celebrate the, the thing that isn't like the rest. Um, that said, you know, it, it, it takes on a life of its own and it does reflect a lack of skepticism and a lack of willingness to ask hard questions. And then it's really like a snowball rolling downhill and becoming an avalanche. Once there's a certain weight of stories that say this woman is the greatest thing since sliced bread, um, it it almost it, it becomes like concrete again. It becomes this it becomes almost impossible to say, no, 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 wait, maybe she's not. And it takes a, a different a different kind of mind. To, to say that. And Jim Chanos, the short, the well-known short seller who was the one who tipped me off to Enron, once said to me years ago, decades ago actually, frighteningly enough, but he once said, I have, it's really easy to find really smart people who want to work for me, obviously, but what's really difficult is finding someone with a skeptical mindset who can not only see things differently, but continue to see things differently even when the rest of the world is telling them they're, they're they're wrong. And I think that is, there's just, there's just a subset of people who are inclined to look at the world through a skeptical lens and it, and it isn't most people. And I'm, I'm not sure that's a bad thing. Let me talk about you for a while. Um, Hibbing, Minnesota. Yeah. What was it like growing up in Hibbing and what did your parents do? So Hibbing is a small town about a four hour drive north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. It's often the coldest spot in the United States. And it's historically the main um, source of employment there has been taconite mining, um, which was converted into iron ore. And actually iron ore from the mines in northern Minnesota uh, was the ingredient. And in, I think something like 50 percent of the steel that was used and that came out of the United States for, for World War II. It was a huge, huge industry um, back in the day. 
day. But the um, economic underpinning of the town really fell apart in the, st- in the eight, 70s and 80s with the collapse of the American steel industry. And really nothing nothing has come along to, to replace it. Um, so it was... It was an interesting place to grow up, both because, oh, I should have said, it's the, also where Bob Dylan grew up, a um, girl from the North Country. Um, so it was an interesting place to grow up in the sense that it was a place where the fundamental moorings of uh, were being ripped out from underneath it as I, as I went through high school. I think something like 30% of the town was on unemployment by the time I was in high school because the mines were shutting down and the major source of employment was going away. And kids traditionally had graduated from high school and followed their dads and gone to work in the mines and that had provided a really stable life and all of that was, was, was disappearing. Um, but the place hadn't, and I don't know if it still has kind of adapted to that new reality. My high school was around 300 people in the graduating class, and there were two of us who left the state for for college. Um, That's it. So my parents weren't weren't from there. Um, My my dad was a doctor, and uh, that's why he ended up moving there. He wanted to live in a small town in the middle of nowhere where he could hunt and fish and not be troubled by other people. (laughs) So... That's that's where that's where we ended up. But my my dad is actually originally from Mississippi um, and my mom is from Connecticut. So they were they were outsiders to to the town. So how did what were you like in high school and what led you to Williams College? So I I was um, I was a smart kid who pretended she wasn't smart because there wasn't a lot of and it's you know an interesting different discussion about about places in the country that don't encourage academic achievement. But the Hibbing that I grew up in was was one of those, although I had two teachers, brothers in high school, one named Matt Bergen and one named Dan Bergen, who were my English and math teachers, who I think were the best teachers any kid could could ask for. They were, they were phenomenal. Um, Matt deluded me into thinking I was good at math and Dan uh, taught me how to write. <laughs> so, 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 so with that, um, so with that said, um, but I, I so I I was basically a smart kid who who pretended she wasn't smart, um, um, and that was I think that pretty much sums me up in high school, <laughs> and I ended up at Williams. Not I'm not sure. Uh, um, I like to believe I would have had the gumption to get myself to a good school, but I I don't really know. We're all products of our environment, and my environment was not one that said leave the state and go to a great college. But my parents weren't weren't from Hibbing, as I mentioned. My mom had gone to Smith and was a big fan of the small uh, East Coast liberal arts schools. And my parents basically said to me the entire time I was going through school, you are going far away to college. You're leaving here and you're not coming back. And so I, it was just a given that I would apply to the best colleges I could and, and go and, and, and not come back. Are they still alive, by the way, your parents? They are. Yeah, they're back living in Mississippi. (laughs) Oh, interesting. A couple of quotes that I want to feed back to you and get your reaction. I stay outside the system. Your quote. Yeah, so... (laughs) So I do think that what happens to a lot of journalists, there's that great, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately, there's that great C.S. Lewis story, the inner circle, the inner ring, and it basically says that once you're on the inside, it becomes you'll do anything you possibly can to stay on the inside because the warm glow of being on the inside and instead of pushing your nose up against the pain is just so overwhelmingly wonderful that you'll do anything not not to get kicked out of it. And I think there's a real danger in that, particularly for, for journalists, because once you're on the inside and you're getting invited to the right part and hanging out with CEOs. Well, it's a human, a very human to want to be liked and to want their approval. And generally the way you get their approval is to go along with what, what they think. And I don't think people do that deliberately. I think it's just it's just human nature. It's the Overton window, right? Which has become kind of an in vogue thing lately that wanting to w- wanting to be reflected, wanting to see your reflection in a way that is that is that it, that that is um, appealing to those around you, that makes you liked by those that gets you approval from 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 those around you and so i think making sure that you don't think of yourself as an insider and that you stay on on the outside is really important especially for journalists and probably for investors as well you say i'm always a contrarian i think that that is not always a good thing it's true Generally, when most people think one way, I want to think the other way. It's 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 a very instinctive um, reaction on my part. It's a reflex. 
it's not always a good thing in that if you're contrarian for the sake of being contrarian, that's just as bad as believing for the sake of being a believer, right? I mean, it, it, you have to, if you're inclined to be contrarian, then you have to question your contrarianism as much as if you're inclined to believe, you have to question your belief, right? Uh, because just not liking something because everybody else likes it is not, in the end, a very good answer. Quote, Bethany McLean, I'm the opposite of a motivational speaker. Well, I, I've said that in speeches that I've given because I like to talk about business gone wrong. And I've spent most of the last 20 years covering these stories of, of, of business gone wrong. But uh, which so talking about how things go wrong is sort of the opposite of a motivational speaker, right? Because motivational speakers talk about how things go right. But I actually think that you can learn a lot of lessons from the stories of, of how things go wrong. In the end, maybe more lessons than you learn from the stories of, of things going right. Are you writing a book now? I am. My longtime collaborator, Joe Nocera, he was uh, my editor at Fortune, and he edited The Smartest Guys in the Room, and we uh, wrote All the Devils Are Here, our book about the financial crisis together, and I are writing a book about the pandemic, um, which is very, very difficult and complicated, probably the hardest thing I've tried to do. Can you give us a sense of how you're going at it? Sure. So what we're trying to do is sort of a similar approach that we took in All the Devils Are Here, where we went back decades and looked at the fundamental problems that helped create the financial crisis and how they were set in motion and who set them in motion and why. And we're trying to do the same thing here, which is to look at the fundamental problems in our economy, the the pandemic either highlighted or exacerbated everything from a capitalist driven healthcare model to outsourcing of essential manufacturing. Let me go back to Elizabeth Holmes for a moment and go back to the attempt to try to find out what works and doesn't work around keeping people honest. We, we, we talked about the media, we've talked about the board members of the corporation. We haven't talked about the jurors in the trial. Yeah. What's your take on the jurors? And are we served well by that system of uh, dealing with uh, criminal activity? I don't know. I'll start with the last one. It's a lot to ask 12 people without any experience in financial wrongdoing to listen to testimony and the way in which charges are brought in these kind of cases doesn't necessarily line up with our fundamental sense of right and wrong. And what I mean by that is that anyone who read John Kerry Riz's book or saw Alex's movie and thought about this would say, it is totally wrong for Elizabeth Holmes to have promised her blood tests could do things that they couldn't do. She endangered people's health. How how awful is, is that? Of course she could spend time in jail. And yet the jury didn't find her guilty. On that, on that, and part of that is because you have to bring very specific charges and say, you can't just say, generally, Elizabeth Holmes lied, find her guilty or not guilty. You have to say, she lied to this patient in, in this way. And sometimes when you boil charges down to the specifics like that, you, 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 can't, you can't prove that, that, that she knew. And that speaks to not an issue with the jury system necessarily, but to a larger issue to which there is no easy answer in corporate America, which is that executives can insulate themselves from wrongdoing by layers of lawyers and accountants and underlings who then take the fall when, when things go wrong, because the executive can say, well, I relied on their assurances that all of this was, was fine. And then the executive can't be found guilty, even if that person actually profited from all of the wrongdoing. That's part of the story of the financial crisis. Angelo Mozilla, the former CEO of Countrywide, um, um, was, was able to say, I relied on, 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 on my underlings, and they told me everything, everything was fine. And so that's, that, and that, in, in a way, you want it to be that way because no executive would, would we would really constrain risk-taking in business in dangerous ways if executives couldn't rely on the advice of their lawyers and accountants. And yet, it can also become fundamentally wrong, and I don't mean that in a legal way, but I mean it in a moral way, because the person who makes the most money from wrongdoing 
can also be the one who can't be held accountable for it in, in the end. And that's, I wrote about um, Steve Cohen and SAC Capital, which was a hedge fund that was always rumored to be engaged in insider trading that the Department of Justice went after aggressively um, um, in, the early, in the early teens. And in the end, they were able to charge SAC Capital itself with, with fraud, but they couldn't get to Steve Cohen because they couldn't prove that he knew because he was insulated from, by these layers of underlings and, and and lawyers from 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 any of the wrongdoing that 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 took place at his his fund, so that that to me is a fundamental tension in our in our system, and I don't I don't have a great a great means of of resolving it. But the issue with the jurors, another part of the story with the jurors and the Elizabeth Holmes verdict, gets back to the op ed I wrote, and I and this 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 question of this law between visionaries and fraudsters, one of the jurors said in an interview after after the verdict that we believe that Elizabeth believed in her technology. We we think we think she believed in it, and therefore we didn't find her guilty on on on, on these charges of defrauding patients. And it's this really interesting question about about belief, right? And it does it can get you off the hook with criminal charges because you have to show intent. And if you believed, then you didn't have intent to, to defraud anybody. But in the larger sense, the larger ethical sense, again, again, is is belief an excuse? I struggled with this a lot when I was writing about Enron because I thought at various times, well, Jeff Skilling believed in Enron. And so how can he be an evil villain, the mastermind behind this this fraud if, if, if he believed? And my, my former father-in-law, um, I was I was telling him this over dinner, and I still remember him looking at me and saying, "Bethany, the worst crimes in human history have been committed by by people who believed." And so Alex Gibney, the filmmaker who made the inventor about Elizabeth Holmes and made the documentary "The Smartest Guys in the Room," and I have talked about this question of belief: is it an excuse, even if it is legally speaking, or is actually belief in in is is belief the greatest sin of them all? And, and so I think that's an interesting question too, but I, I don't know. So I don't know. In the end, juries are juries in our legal system are set up to rule on on pretty narrow matters. They're not set up to say, "I look at this situation and declare it bad and and, and send this person to jail." Um, that's 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 for the court of public opinion and all of our all of our morality. And I guess in the end, that's probably. I concluded my New York Times op-ed on this note, well, if I were charged with, with a crime, I would want the jury just to look at the individual facts in my case. And I didn't say this part of it, but you're making me think about this part as well, and determine what I did that was actually against the law, not just what I did that they don't like. <laughs> um, because in the end, a, a legal system that worked on people's individual senses of outrage would be a pretty dangerous decision. And it may make us upset when we're all outraged about Elizabeth Holmes that she wasn't found guilty on the counts on which would like her to be guilty. But if in the end that were you up there, you sure wouldn't want the outrage of the crowd to determine your your life, right? So 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 it's all it's complicated. This may be a small matter, but what was your reaction to the fact that Elizabeth Holmes' father worked for Enron? You know, not not much. Um, there were a lot of really good people who worked for Enron, and a lot of people who either weren't in a position to see wrongdoing, who worked in areas where there wasn't any wrongdoing, or who were in a position to see wrongdoing but simply didn't see it for some of these reasons that we've we've talked about. I've actually often asked myself over the years if when I was leaving Goldman um, in 1995 and, you know, going to executive recruiters in an effort to say, what should I do next? And I wanted to be a journalist, but I had no training in journalism and you know, just got lucky to get a job at Fortune. And if I hadn't and an executive recruiter had said, hey, you know, there's this really innovative energy company down in Houston, Texas called Enron. And, you know, they have an interest in people with financial minds. And wouldn't you like to go talk to them? And if I had ended up working at Enron back in the late 1990s, would I have been a believer or would I have been a skeptic? And of course I want to believe I would have been a skeptic, but the truth is I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Another aspect of the checks and balances is the, is the government. You made a comment, and it, I never, never paid attention to this, that the FDA gets a lot of its money from the people that they are regulating. Uh, the pharma, pharma, uh, com pharmaceutical companies and others, the <clears throat> FDA, the SEC, the Justice Department. Uh, first of all, if you can tell us any more about the FDA and the, the money part of this, uh, 
what influence do you think that has on the FDA? If that, it, how, and how much of their money do they get from the people that they regulate? Well, I knew the answer to this at one point. I like to blame the couple of years of this pandemic and not just my advancing age on um, the fact that I no longer have facts at my fingertips. <laughs> but it's it's under the um, under the way in which they approve, they investigate new drugs is mainly funded by the drug drug companies themselves. And there was a law that was passed that enabled this, this, this kind of funding. I'm not, and I had st stumbled on this and learned about it because of a piece I did for Vanity Fair on the Sackler family and the opioid crisis, where I think this issue was, was most pronounced. But I'm not sure in, in the end that the money is the major problem. I think it's the bias toward belief toward wanting to be liked, particularly by people you think are smart. So there's the FDA and people come in and these executives present them with, with this amazing, amazing data and these drugs that seem powerful and like they, 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 they do something and sometimes they get, they get swayed by that. Not, not always, and I actually think the FDA does on balance a, a, a really good job and I do not want to sow uh, any skepticism about the FDA particularly with with the vaccines right 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 now I'm very wary of that but yet you you look back on the opioid crisis and the FDA could have for all the blame that the Sackler family gets the FDA could have shut that down by refusing to approve these drugs and it was the FDA's unwillingness to listen to skeptics and um, um, willingness to, to, to believe um, that that allowed this to 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 gain the momentum that 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 it, that it did, and so I th I think that's a problem throughout large parts of our society, and I think it is there are large parts of our regulatory system, um, and I think it is less a question of explicit corruption. I give you money and you give me this than it is than it is kind of implicit corruption. The the desire to be liked and the willingness to believe in other people seem to be like like you. I think that explains part of the lack of prosecutions and the bailouts in, in the financial crisis was that it was it was our crowd. It was all people that people in government knew. And so they looked at the big bank CEOs and thought, well, this isn't your fault. This is, you know, we all made a mistake um, versus Enron, which was these cowboys down in Houston, Texas. It was easier to say they're, they're not us. We're going to go after them. Them with everything the gov everything all the might the government can 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 muster, and so I think that that um, I think that that issue plays out plays out in 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 many many ways. How many, or how often do you write for Vanity Fair? Not as much any any more, in part because I I I was hired by Graydon Carter and he left the magazine a few a few years ago, but also in part because of this this book on on, on the pandemic, which is difficult enough and <laughs> going to be overdue enough already. Please, I hope my publisher isn't listening to this. That I I even though there must be twenty stories I would love to be working on now, I don't have the time to do anything else, so I have to get this done before before I do anything else. But I think Vanity Fair is still one of the few great outlets remaining. This will be what book for you? What number book? So it will be the third big book, but I also wrote two mini books for a um, publisher called Columbia Global Reports, which is sponsored by Columbia University and which had had this idea to do short books on important topics that weren't getting covered by the mainstream press um, and, 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 but, but that weren't necessarily um, fodder for, for a long book. Can you make enough money doing what you're doing to survive? Oh, it's it's tricky. Um, Vanity Fair at the time when I started there paid enough money per story that if you wrote three stories a year for the magazine, you were doing really well. That has changed dramatically. Um, I it, it is a constant, and during these years of the pandemic, a lot of us made a fair amount of money through speaking. And during these years of the pandemic, that has that has gone away. People are experimenting with lots of new models, like like Substack. But <laughs> I think as a lot of us do as we get old, older. I look back on the early years of my career at Fortune magazine where I had a salary and a good salary. 
flurry at, at, at that and health insurance and, and everything else. And I think, wow, what I would do for that again, right? Um, and the ability, most importantly, the ability to, and this is, I mean, I left Goldman Sachs to become a journalist because money, making money is not the most important thing to me. And that for better or worse has always been the case and is still the case. But, but most importantly, working in that sort of environment enabled me to take on stories like Enron that might that might have not panned out, but I didn't have to worry that, oh, then I don't get paid. Whereas in the current environment for people who are freelancers, if your story doesn't get published, you don't you don't get paid. So there's an incentive to choose pieces and choose things to do that you know are gonna work. And I think I think that's problematic. Do you do a podcast still? I do. I had tried to do one on my own, um, which I really enjoyed, um, but I probably chose the, the wrong outlet for it. I, I chose an outlet called Luminary that was subscription backed and subscriptions hadn't really taken off at that time. And I was an unknown podcaster. And so for me to try to get people to pay for my podcast was, was, was the wrong decision. But I started doing a podcast with a professor at the University of Chicago, an economics professor named Luigi Zangales. And we do a podcast that, that touches on some of the themes you and I have talked about today because it's called Capital Isn't and the idea is to look at areas in which capital, capitalism is working and areas in which it isn't working and the intersection between um, capital, capitalism and, and democracy. And it's, it's really fun. I think about a lot of things that I wouldn't think about if it weren't for doing this podcast. So it is um, intellectually expansive. <laughs> uh, just a couple questions. <clears throat> Are you <clears throat> political? Do you have strong p political views? I, you know, I am not. Um, I think one of the things I'm wrestling with, and it goes back to the question you had asked earlier I, about whether I've become more cynical or not. I I wrote an essay uh, for Scribd on on this very question of, of 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 cynicism, and as part of that, I thought about my political beliefs, and I think I was reflexively very free market because my parents were quite anti-union when I was growing up. They blamed the demands of the union for shutting down um, some of the mines in, in in northern Minnesota, and I went to work at Goldman, and then I worked at Fortune, and both were places that were in innately celebratory of capitalism and, and the free market system. And over the years, I've become increasingly increasingly skeptical of, so, so at one point I would have described myself as sort of right-leaning on questions of the economy and left-leaning on, on social questions. And now I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure, I'm not so sure. We are out of time. Um, you can get on Wikipedia, to find out the books that you've written and I, are they all still available uh, through yeah. Amazon? They're all still available, yes. All, all hardback copies are also available? So the, uh, no, I don't think any of the hardbacks are available, and the mini books I wrote were not pub were only published in soft cover format, so they were never available in, in hardbacks. Of everything you've done, what's the single most successful? Probably smartest guys in the room. I used to, for many years, I thought I could do a piece of work that someday would have me be something other than Enron girl. But I think I am um, resigned to being Enron girl or Enron old lady <laughs> in future years at this stage. Thank you, Beth and McLean, very much. Thank you for having me on. It was delightful, as always. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.